Today we start a new series uh, from Genesis 25 to 35 called God of Jacob. Uh, It's a narrative, a story, an account that's full of intrigue and family conflict and uh, people cheating and cheaters cheating cheaters. On the other hand, it's a story of God working out his marvellous plan uh, to bless the nations. Let's put it in the context of God's big plan. Uh, The diagram that you see there uh, takes us from creation through to the new creation. And this is the overarching story of the Bible and of God's plan in dealing with people. And you'll see that a lot happens in between, uh, like the terrible fall of our first parents, Adam and Eve. And then the narrowing down of God's promises as he promises to Abraham. The further narrowing down of those promises uh, to a remnant of Israel. Uh, And then finally, those promises uh, get down to being fulfilled in one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then after that, there's a broadening out uh, as the disciples of Jesus follow him, as uh, fellow Jews turn to Jesus and trust in his death and resurrection on their behalf, and so on until the promises of God reach out to the nations and to you and to me. Then the final step is the restoration of all things and the ushering in of the new creation. So where does Jacob fit in this scenario? Well, he's just after Abraham. Abraham uh, is his grandfather. So Jacob is an inheritor of the promises made to Abraham uh, for land, for blessing, uh, for a great nation to come from him, and beyond that, blessing to the nations. In the lead up to our section, Abraham has married off his son, Isaac, uh, to Rebekah, and then he dies. Now, far from uh, having inherited the land that God promised, which was uh, about the size of Victoria, by the way, uh, and all the descendants that God promised him, Abraham, when Abraham dies, he has one son of the promise and he has enough land for him to be buried in. It would be measured in square metres rather than square kilometres. So it leaves this question hanging, how are these promises going to be fulfilled? And of course, that's the story of the rest of Scripture and the rest of the Old Testament. And so we look forward to how is God going to fulfil these promises when so far it seems that so little has happened? Well, there are many unusual answers to that question as the New Testament unfolds, and particularly in our section, there are many, many twists and turns. Uh, And today we're going to see, as we look at the God of Jacob, the God of the trickster, that uh, there are praying parents, there are warring sons, there is the schemer who gets the better of the despiser of the promises of God. Finally, we're going to look at How is it that this God of Jacob can be the God of this trickster? So firstly, praying parents, as we look at verse 19, we see it's introduced by the phrase, these are the generations of, or rather this is the account of Isaac. Now, this is the eighth time this expression has been used. It's like the chapter headings in the book of Genesis. There are 10 of them. And this is number eight. The first one is actually, this is the generations or the account of the heavens and the earth. Uh, So this section we're looking at is God's dealings, God's fulfilling his promises uh, through Jacob. Isaac is 40 when he marries Rebekah. And for the second time uh, in scripture, we read that somebody is barren. So Rebekah can't or doesn't have children. Again, it's the person who has inherited the promise, the promise of Abraham, who is in this position. You can't help noticing as you read the first bit of chapter 25, how easily the people who are not in the line of promise have kids. Keturah, for example, has six boys without any bother and goodness knows how many girls. But when it comes to the children of promise, uh, there's barrenness, there's difficulty. And here it occurs again. Now, Isaac, in contrast to Abraham, goes to the Lord and prays and asks God uh, to open Rebekah's womb and provide them with a child. And God hears his prayer and answers 
Rebecca miraculously falls pregnant at the age of 60. Secondly, we see that there are warring sons in verses 22 to 28. Pregnancy is a difficult one. Uh, There's an incredible amount of conflict uh, in the womb. The text says that the children struggle together within her. It's a pretty mild translation of the original. Uh, Literally, it means that they crushed one another or oppressed one another. Uh, If you were doing an Aussie translation of this, you would probably say uh, they beat each other to a pulp inside of her. Now, Rebecca is troubled by this, of course, and she's fed up with it. Uh, She says, if it's like this, why am I here? Uh, Many an exhausted pregnant mum has said something like that. She goes to inquire of the Lord. Uh, What's happening here, Lord? And the Lord tells her uh, what that battle in her womb is about. Uh, That it's about two nations uh, who will struggle and uh, oppose one another. But the older will serve the younger. The younger will win. Now, we're not told how Rebecca responds to this. I'm pretty sure she didn't say, oh, goody. Uh, She's longing for an end to this, uh, like most pregnant mums, but this is particularly hard. But the Lord's answer to her is pretty much, well, if you think that's bad, you haven't seen anything yet. These two are going to be warring against one another. Uh, Just note here that God's response to Isaac and Rebecca's prayers are a picture of how it often goes with prayer, aren't they? So Isaac's prayer asking for a child, his heart's desire and Rebecca's heart's desire is granted. Uh, But Rebecca's inquiry, is I'm sure it's not the kind of answer she's looking for. And isn't that the way it goes with our prayers sometimes? Sometimes God gives us the desires of our hearts. Sometimes God has another plan that we probably don't like but it's a much better one eventually, Uh, better for God's glory and better for us. Uh, God's response to Rebecca also tells us that uh, he's not going to use human means uh, to fulfil his promises. He's not going to work according to the culture and the custom of the time. He's turning that on its head. Uh, The older is going to serve the younger. The older was the primary inheritor of the whatever the father had but god is saying no the younger one uh, is going to take that role Uh, god chooses what humanly speaking is is a secondary uh, to bring about his purposes and he does that of course so it can be really apparent that this is his work it's not coming about by human effort Uh, as paul says in corinthians god chooses the weak uh, to confound the wise And this is all through scripture, isn't it? Uh, Think Moses, the stammerer, David, the shepherd boy, uh, Paul, the tormentor of the church. Uh, Think William Carey, a great missionary to India who was a a shoemaker. More locally, John Williams, who spearheaded the outreach into much of the Pacific, was an ironmonger's apprentice. And yet when he got to the Pacific and started preaching the gospel in Tahiti, uh, people turned to Christ. And because he was from a humble background, God used him mightily uh, because when when it came to other people coming from other islands and saying, hey, why don't you come over here and tell us this message, it's so good. Uh, John Williams said, no, I I, I won't do that. Uh, Some of the local people from our island can go and do that. And that's how the gospel spread like wildfire throughout the Pacific. Uh, Because John Williams wasn't trusting in himself, he was trusting in God and his power. Well, when they're finally born, uh, these two uh, have a very unusual birth. The second one comes out holding on to the heel uh, of the first one. The first one is red and hairy. He's called Esau, uh, which means hairy. It's not a flattering name, and uh, nor is his nickname, Edom, uh, which means red. It's not much better. Uh, But if you think that's bad. Then how about the name of the second twin? Uh, the trickster, the supplanter, the, the tripper-upper. Uh, it, it means he deceives. What a horrible start to a family. Uh, and it looks forward to what's going to happen. 
Now, the big tragedy in this story is that the parents uh, reinforce this conflict that started in the womb. And so we read uh, in verse 28, a very sad commentary, Isaac loved Esau uh, because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. It was a house divided against itself. And friends, what havoc that can wreak in a family uh, where you hear people say, don't you, oh no, she's daddy's little girl or he's mummy's boy. And where they, people have favourites. And this here is a lesson in how not to do it. Uh, the ongoing destructive force of favouritism in families, uh, we know it only too well, don't we? Uh, some of us, it's very close to us in our own families and it's for decades has caused rifts in families. And kids, of course, want the love and affection of their parents and they need to have it, but it ought not to be at the expense of love and affection uh, for the other members of the family. Paul says to parents, don't exasperate your children. One of the ways that we can do that is by playing favourites. And that's what's going on uh, in this family here. And uh, the conflict that began in Rebecca's womb uh, continued uh, down uh, through the centuries. 500 years later, as Jacob's descendants uh, come out of Egypt to go into the promised land. Esau's descendants hassle them uh, on the way. 1,200 years later, as Jerusalem is destroyed and the Israelites are taken out of the promised land, uh, Esau's descendants, the Edomites, laugh at them and, and curse them. Then we get to the time of Jesus, the Herods. King Herod who tried to get rid of the baby Jesus at birth. The Herods who mocked him. The Herod who, who uh, beheaded John the Baptist. Uh, that family are all descendants uh, of Esau. So warring sons. Thirdly, the schemer beats the despiser in verses 29 to 35. Uh, these boys grow up and they live very different lives. Uh, Jacob uh, hangs around the tents. He's a mummy's boy. He's into things like cooking. He's more likely to appear on MasterChef uh, than in the AFL Grand Final. Esau, on the other hand, is the rugged, hairy, macho type. Uh, and he loves hunting and going out into the fields. Uh, he's more the Bear grills type. Uh, one day, Esau comes in from the fields and he's absolutely starving. And Jacob has just put the finishing touches on a lovely red curry or red stew. And the smell of this and his own appetite overpowers Esau. And he says, give me some of that stew. Jacob the schemer here senses an opportunity, uh, like the telemarketer uh, who calls you and when they sense that you're a little bit interested in their product. Of course, they tell you you have to decide right now. And so Jacob says to Esau, sell me your birthright right now. The sad response from Esau is, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? The unspoken words that he's saying are, it's of no use to me. And right here we're witnessing the transaction that is so often made. Short-term gain uh, with, for long-term pain. A fast buck uh, for a slow death. Momentary pleasure uh, for eternal torment. Jacob the schemer, uh, true to his name, gets his brother to swear uh, that he's giving up his birthright. This is the ancient equivalent of the exchange of contracts. And uh, Esau does it. And the settlement uh, comes swiftly and sweetly as Jacob throws in some bread as well to make the deal even more pal palatable. And the text tells us that Esau ate his fill and went his way. His belly is full for the night, but his birthright is gone forever. 
The sad conclusion that is at the end of this passage is thus Esau despised his birthright. It doesn't say he gave it up, that he sold it, but that he despised it. So the schemer uh, gets the better of the despiser. Uh, this account is full of twists and turns and flawed characters of intrigue and of dysfunctional family life. Uh, is it just a lesson in how to avoid family troubles? How not to do it? Is there more to it than this? Now that's not why it's in the Bible, although we can learn stuff like that. Why is it in the Bible? Well, there's one thing we haven't considered. We haven't considered the main character in this story, and that is God himself. What is he doing? What does he think about all this? And that's our final point, the God of Jacob. The rest of scripture, of course, helps us with this because this incident is referred to. We're not left guessing, and I want to bring three things uh, as we conclude. Firstly, God holds Jacob and Esau to account uh, for their actions. Uh, the prophet Hosea says in chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, the Lord has an indictment against Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. He will repay him according to his deeds. In the womb, he took his brother by the heel and in his manhood, he strove with God. So Jacob is held to account by God here uh, for his skullduggery. Esau is also held to account the writer of the Hebrews is writing to people who are tempted under persecution to turn away from following Jesus. He talks about Esau. He says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no one is unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Both of these guys are responsible before God and God calls them out on their failure and their sin. Secondly, uh, in all these machinations, uh, the main character of the story, God is actively bringing about his good purposes. And Paul talks about this in Romans 9 where he looks at this incident and says, well, what is God doing here? He's choosing uh, the younger over the older. And uh, he says this, when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Paul's saying here, before these guys had even done any of the stupid and wrong things that they did, God, in his electing purposes, had chosen Jacob over Esau. And he puts it very starkly, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Which basically means I have chosen Jacob, but rejected Esau. Well, straight away. We're all thinking that is not fair. And Paul anticipates that question. What shall we say then? Uh, is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Which is what we've seen from the beginning of this saga, even in the birth of uh, this child of promise. The point Paul is making here is that the fact that anybody is saved, that anybody is an inheritor and receives the promises of God or any nation uh, inherits or receives those promises is totally an act of the mercy of God. Us human beings, we love to do things on the basis of merit. The best candidate gets the job. The best business plan gets the funding, and so on. But God acts differently. The reason for his choice is not rooted in who we are and what we do 
uh, but in who he is and his compassion and mercy. And friends, that is so comforting, isn't it? This is not performance-based. Uh, who we are before God and experiencing and knowing the promises of God and receiving the benefits of them is totally because of his loving character, uh, which does not change. Thirdly here, God is making a big point in his choice of Jacob, the schemer. It's a point that's made in the rest of the Old Testament. In the Psalms, over and over again, uh, God is called the God of Jacob, much more so than the God of Abraham or Isaac or the God of all three. In Isaiah, uh, God's people, Israel, are referred to as the house of Jacob. Why would God want to be called by that name? If you were going to pick someone out of the lineup of the patriarchs, Jacob would be the last one he would choose. But God does. So what point is he making? He's making it really clear that he has come for such people. That the target of the promises of God are people who are sinners like you and me. Friends, if we're really honest, uh, we would have to say there's a bit of the schema in all of us. Uh, we all are capable, uh, if not do, uh, manipulate people around us, situations, the facts at times, for our own advantage. And God says that he has come for such people. And in the death of Jesus, he makes a bold declaration that he's actually reaching out to bring people like that into his family. In fact, the whole of humanity is like that, the Bible tells us. And what God is doing is in calling himself the God of Jacob is saying, I've come for you. I want you to inherit these promises. I want you to trust in me. I want you to trust in my son who gave himself for you. So friends, this is really good news, isn't it? But I think sometimes people think, well, oh, I'm not good enough to be a Christian. Some of you know about Jordan Peterson, the uh, Canadian psychologist who wrote that book, The Twelve Rules for Life. He has a big following amongst young men in particular. And he says so many things that uh, come out of the Bible and, uh, and uh, are Christian, if you like. And of course, he's question over and over again, uh, are you a Christian? And his response has been to take that name is such a huge thing uh, it means that I need to be like Jesus and I'm not and I don't think it's achievable so I don't want to be called a Christian. It's a noble thought, isn't it? But if I had the chance to talk to Jordan, I'd say, Jordan, it's not about that. You've done the first bit. You've acknowledged that you're unworthy but you need to come to know Jesus. You need to trust him uh, because it's not about you being worthy enough uh, to be in his family. It's about you trusting him to forgive you and to begin that process of making you worthy, uh, which you have in Christ when you trust him. Friends, as we conclude, I want to say to you, if you've not yet trusted Jesus, please do so. Uh, Jesus extends his mercy to you. Jesus says to you, trust me, come to me whoever you are, in whatever state you are, turn from going your own way. Turn from thinking that you'll ever be worthy enough uh, to be with God. Turn from that idea and trust yourself to the one who is worthy and who died in your place so that he could make you worthy. Do not despise God's offer of mercy and of rescue. And secondly, I want to say if you are a believer, Please don't despise your birthright. Please don't sell it for some short-term gratification, whatever it is, wealth, career, power, pleasure. The writer of the Hebrews says, don't do that. Don't go down that path. Keep trusting in the Lord Jesus. Keep making your decisions on the basis of your relationship with him, not on the basis 
of what feels best to you. That's the message of this God of the trickster, that we can be rescued and that we can keep following Jesus. Let's pray and ask God to help us with this. Our gracious God, we thank you that uh, you have made it so clear right through scripture that uh, your promises are for those who are weak, uh, who are despised, those who uh, acknowledge that they are sinners and that they need your help. Lord, uh, I pray for each one of us today that we might know uh, your mercy, your grace in our lives, that we might not despise that offer, that we might receive it and accept it wholeheartedly. I pray, Lord, for those of us who have already done that, Lord, that you would help us not to despise our birthright, uh, not to give up what is eternal uh, for something that's temporary, not to give up uh, your great riches uh, for the sake of something temporary here. And uh, Lord, we pray for the power and the strength of your spirit uh, that we might continue to love and serve you and pass on this wonderful message uh, to the nations that you want to bless through your people. And we pray it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.